Should I rely on the CPP? Will it still be there when I retire? How much can I really expect out of it? When should I get it? How does it work? Will I lose it if I have other sources of income? We will answer all of that and more in this video. In this video, we'll talk all things CPP. Watch the whole thing because I clarify some misinformation you may have heard from your friends. Also, be sure to leave this video a like because I'm wearing the brightest pink blazer you've ever seen. I'm bringing spring vibes, baby, and I hope that your retirement is just as bright. Let's go. So how does the CPP work? The Canada Pension Plan provides monthly benefits to Canadian retirees usually at 65, but you can start taking it as early as 60 years old or delay it as far back as 70. You and your employer will have to make contributions to your CPP throughout your working years. The funds are then invested and managed by an independent board who oversees the viability of the fund to make sure that it's around when you actually need to draw an income. How much do I have to put in to the CPP? Based on the current rules, you have to, meaning it's not optional, you have to put in 5.95% of any income you earn above $3,500 until you hit the yearly maximum pensionable earnings limit or YMPE. For 2023, that's income of $66,600. This amount, whatever your contribution is, is then matched by your employer. If you're self-employed, you have to make both the employee and employer contributions to make sure you are fully funding the CPP, which would amount to about $7,500 of contributions for 2023. This 5.95% of CPP contributions is an increase since 2019. This is a part of a multi-year, multi-phase enhancement designed to make the CPP better. It's designed to increase CPP by up to 50% once it's completed. As it stands, the CPP is currently structured to replace about one-fourth of the average Canadian's income while they are still working. Once the enhancements are done, it's earmarked to replace their income to about a third of their working income while they're now in retirement. One of the changes is that in 2024, there will become a secondary contribution tier if your income is above the base YMPE. The second ceiling is 14% higher than the regular YMPE. This will enhance your benefits if you're consistently earning above the YMPE. Can I rely on the CPP to still be there for me when I retire? Now, despite all the negative spins and the constant fear mongering and conspiracy theories around CPP, the CPPIB, now known as the CPP Investments, have done a fairly good job to make sure the fund does exactly what it's supposed to do. They're independent in a sense that they are not controlled by the government. There's been attempts to politicize investment choices and strategies using funds as a guise of ethical and social responsibility. Now, as of now, the board operates for you and I, not the parties in power or even if they're clearly incorruptible and morally superior compared to you and me, right? <laughs> now, the CPP actual audits are done and published every three years, giving an estimate of viability, asset-based contributions, and the benefit that could be paid out. The last report shows that they manage about 539, probably closer to $540 billion now, and gave a sustainability estimate of 75 years. It means that it's gonna be there for the next 75 years at least. The way the funds are invested is well thought out, it's prudent, and it's diversified. So in my opinion, it's going to be there. From a political standpoint, it's also career suicide for any politician to try to put measures in place to remove or to reduce the benefits. So I don't think that it'll suffer from that standpoint. So for now, we can rely on the CPP to provide a strong foundation for retirement for most Canadians when it's time for them to access these funds and it's time for them to retire. How much can I expect out of the CPP? The current CPP maximum for 2023 is $1,306.57. But the average payout in October of 2022 was just $717.15. So that's what the average Canadian should expect out of CPP. What you actually get, of course, is based on your own personal contributions. If you qualify for some somewhere near the average, you'll have about 700 bucks, and that's adjusted for inflation annually. 
for your own contributions and for your own benefit, that is based on a multi-step calculation to determine just how much you'll receive. It's best to just visit the Service Canada website if you wanted something with a little bit more accuracy. However, if you're still years from retirement and you just want a rough way to estimate how close you'd be to the maximum, that's based on the YMPE and your personal earned income. In 2023, the YMPE is $66,600. After you've hit the threshold and you've maxed out, you will no longer make CPP contributions even if you're earning more than that. See, if you earn more than this threshold, you'll likely notice your paycheck gets slightly larger in the middle of the year. That's because you've already paid up your CPP and EI premiums. If this happens to you throughout your career, you'll likely receive the maximum amount or at least close to it. To qualify for the maximum amount, you need to have maxed out your CPP contributions for 39 out of the 47 years from age 18 to 65. Now, even if you have a few years where you made little or no CPP contributions, there is a general dropout rate of 17%, which means that if you worked from 18 to 65, you can leave out about eight years of low income and low contributions to increase your CPP benefit. Here's another note for parents or parents-to-be. Beyond the general dropout provision, you can actually apply for the child rearing provision. This allows you to further drop your low income and low contribution years as long as you have a child that's dependent to you under the age of seven. If you're in a couple, either one of you can opt out for the child rearing provision, but it's not automatically calculated, at least not well from what we've seen. So you have to apply for this. If you're getting less than the CPP maximum, make sure you review your estimates and understand that you can account and review this for the child rearing provision. It's definitely worth it if you can add a few extra hundred dollars into your retirement income. If you're retiring soon, you really need to look into this. Can I take CPP early? The regular CPP benefit starts at 65, but you can get it as early as 60. However, this reduces your benefit by 0.6% every month before you turn 65 and you take CPP. So if you start at 60, you'll lose 36% of your CPP benefit. If you're still working, there are very few circumstances where it makes sense to withdraw from the CPP at 60. Now, even if you're older, if you still want to keep working, it's very likely that delaying CPP could actually benefit you. Now, a reduction in your CPP reduces an inflation protected income. This means a higher reliance on your investments. As the cost of living increases, as inflation creeps up, you have to draw more from your own assets. That's one of the things that you might miss if you think about just taking CPP early for the sake of taking it early without any plan behind it. Let's say you're entitled to the maximum and you decide to take it at 60. You would give up roughly $470.36 every month or $169,000 throughout a 30 year retirement. Do not take this decision lightly. It's a costly mistake if you find out that you had the means to delay CPP to begin with. So now, can I delay my CPP withdrawal? Absolutely, there's a benefit to it too. By taking CPP later, you will benefit from a 0.7% increase in your CPP income every month that you delay between 65 to 70, up to 42%. This increase is significant. Now, I have a bias towards delaying CPP and government benefits for as long as possible because it gives you the most flexibility on how you'll tackle and how you'll withdraw from your registered assets or pre-tax accounts from 60 to 70 years old. Now, delaying the benefit for someone who qualifies for the maximum equates to about $548 every month. That's $164,000 in your pocket if you qualified for the maximum using a 25-year time horizon. So definitely weigh whether it's worth it for you to take it early, right on the regular retirement, or at 70. When should I take my CPP? This is where most of your friends will steer you wrong because it all depends on what they believe and how they're seeing their own financial picture. It depends, right? Some people believe that this is government and money anyway, so I'll draw it as soon as possible, while others believe that you absolutely need to maximize it and just delay for as long as possible without applying any context. There is no simple answer. This relies on what other resources you have your life expectancy, whether you believe you're gonna have a short or a long retirement. A better solution to answering this question is looking at your overall picture and 
taking that into consideration. Ask questions like, how much do you really need to retire? You can't just look at CPP in a vacuum. You have to consider where your other sources of income are coming from as well, whether that's taxable or a non-taxable account. Are you subject to required minimum distributions, just like a RIF? What happens if that kicks in, even if you don't really need the income from it? We have a video giving a summary of the overall retirement income planning process. So you can watch that to get a feel for the other decision factors you need to consider when asking questions about when to take CPP and when to take any government benefits for that matter. We will do a case study showing the cons and the pros of taking CPP early as well as delaying it all the way to 70. You can check that out right here. What else can the CPP do for me? Now, aside from the CPP benefit, Canadians also get access to CPP disability if they suffer from a prolonged and severe disability. The calculation for that is beyond the scope of this video. However, it's important that you know about this. If you qualify for the CPP disability and have dependent children, they could also qualify for some support. We have a video for that. Let's briefly talk about the CPP survivor benefit. Now, your eligibility depends on your own family situation and how long you've been contributing for. If you have a spouse or children, they may be eligible for CPP survivor's benefit if you passed away as a contributor. For spouses to qualify, they must have been married for at least one year. If you were single with no dependents, the only benefit available to you at time of death is $2,500. This is one of the biggest criticisms for the CPP. If an individual is unattached at the time of passing, even if they paid tens of thousands of dollars into the CPP pool throughout their career, there's no benefit beyond $2,500. Now, what if you're married and you're now accounting for the survivor's pension? Here's what most people find surprising. The combined benefit for the CPP survivor payment and the personal CPP is capped, it's limited at the current year's CPP maximum benefit. This means if you're already receiving the CPP maximum for yourself, even if your spouse passed away, that will not increase your own CPP payments. Just as a side note, the OAS does not have any survivor benefit either. So if your retirement plan hinges on both you and your spouse receiving a substantial payment from CPP and OAS, you need to have your financial plan review a risk analysis. What if you or your spouse passed early in retirement? What would that mean for the survivor? What would the sustainable income be if either of those pensions were gone? Will it be enough for the survivor? If not, consider maintaining your life insurance policy throughout retirement or having a backup plan that adjusts for lifestyle feasibility without the extra pension. Here are a few more points to consider as I wrap up. Think of the CPP as a defined benefit plan. You make contributions today, the investments are locked up, you can't change it, you can't touch it, and you have no emotional attachment to the choices that are made within the fund. Honestly, I believe this is one of the reasons why the fund has done well. The December 22 report shows that the five-year annualized return for the CPP fund was at 8.1% while the 10-year return is at 10%, a much better return than what most investors get. Investors who have exerted effort in their timing and in, in their selection, and likely succumbing to fear and greed along the way. We will also create a case study video where I show you a retirement income plan for a couple who relies on government pensions heavily and it accounted for the majority of their retirement income because they have a more frugal lifestyle. So subscribe to the channel to make sure you see that as soon as it comes out. It'll give you a sense of what's possible if you maximize your CPP and OAS benefits in retirement. The next video you're gonna see here gives you an idea of why taking CPP at 60 makes sense and the one after that is the counter argument. What if you delay your CPP all the way to 70? If you found this video helpful, please leave us a like and subscribe to the channel. Actually, 
I would love a comment from you. It really helps our engagement and it makes this video much more powerful. For some reason, the algorithm in YouTube or whatever social media platform you're watching this from actually favors videos that have a lot of comments, have a lot of engagements. So it'll really help me out if you let us know where you're watching this video from or if you have follow-up questions, drop them below. I'll do my best to respond. Till next time, see ya.